Well, welcome once again to Voice of Reason Radio. I am Chris Honholtz, one of two hosts of this program. Unfortunately, the only one you're getting tonight. Uh, I say that somewhat in jest, but mostly because uh, I would much prefer that both of us be here. Uh, my other, my partner in crime, so to speak, my podcast partner, Richard Story, uh, who this program really does not exist without. And I'm telling you, he is the heart of this program. He cannot be with us this week. Uh, Rich, as you know, has... Uh, physical uh, disability issues that sometimes cause him some issues, and this is one of those weeks where he's just having a rough go. And so uh, we're getting him to rest up, try to and take care of the, what he needs to do to feel better and be back here. So if you guys would pray for him, pray for his family, of course, and uh, just pray for swift healing and uh, for him to get the rest. And and I know Rich will hate that I say this, but also pray for him to not worry. <laughs> the poor guy does often feel terrible when he cannot be on the program because of certain things uh, that come up. And this is one of those times I think he somewhat feels bad, like he's not doing what he's supposed to, or he's uh, somehow letting this podcast or the listeners down. And I know you guys know that that's not how you feel about it, certainly not how I feel about it. And it has always been a, kind of a bedrock principle for our, for this show that apart from, number one, that we honor God in all that we do, but that also we take care of family and health first and foremost and um, if, if he can't be here he can't be here he needs to take care of himself so he can take care of his family so pray for him pray for his family pray for him to feel better and that he can be back with us next week uh, I, he would greatly appreciate that I, I know i will as well we want to want to remind you that voice of reason radio is part of the christian podcast community what is that that is a basically a group of christian podcasters who have come together to basically help one another, to help share what other uh, other programs are out there, and to make a collective of sorts where you can find really some of the most sound theological podcasts you can come across. It's a, something of a one-stop shop. And what I will I tell you up front is, and we've said this before, if you're a long-time listener of the program, you know we've said this, the Christian podcast community vets the podcast coming in. Just because it has it, it has a label of Christian on it doesn't mean you get to walk in the door. You don't get to plug in and you don't get to be part of it just because you call yourself Christian. In fact, something we might touch on in a little bit here, uh, that calling oneself Christian, but maybe not so much. And when they vet, they actually look at what do you believe? What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about the gospel? What do you believe about Christ? They are looking for programs that are going to honor God in what they say and do and are theologically sound. And we also have a process by which if, look, if Voice of Reason Radio went heretical, which by God's grace we will not do that, so don't panic, um, we also have a way to address those issues in-house. And if we had to part company with somebody because it was just getting to be too much, then there's a way to do that as well. And if uh, you know programs are, were to come and go, you take your content with you, so it. We do not treat this as if though, uh, as if it's owned by Christian podcast community, and somebody gets ousted and they lose everything. Rather, this is hey, we are all working together, and what you produce is yours, and we want to build up this wonderful resource that we have in the internet uh, to be able to provide sound biblical content. For, for people who are looking for something good to listen to and can be built up and edified by it. So I really encourage you, go check out Christian Podcast Community. I think you'll benefit from it. In addition to that, uh, we always try to remind everybody, we have a website called slavetotheking.com. It is where mostly you will find uh, access to this program. Uh, while we do host through Podbean, which we are grateful for those guys, they have been with us since day one and have treated us very well and always been very helpful. Uh, we post directly to our website and it is also where you can find you know your rss feed to drop it into whatever podcast app you choose maybe you're not an apple podcast user you don't use iphone maybe you use something else and you will have your or you are an iphone user and you have your preferred app of choice well that's where you can go to do that additionally it has access directly to our social media and uh, you, believe it or not, a YouTube page. There's a link for that as well. And <laughs> before anybody get, gets too excited, Rich and I are a little leery on having our mugs on camera. So <laughs> the YouTube page is primarily, at least for now, and it has been for a little bit, is uh, a place where if you prefer to just throw YouTube up 
and hit play and let it run through stuff while you're working or, or uh, you know, whatever free time that you have. That's your primary way of listening. We drop those videos, thanks to Podbean's little mechanism, right into YouTube. And you can listen to the show. It's, it's audio only, and it basically has our logo with the title in the background, that kind of thing. But it's another way that if you prefer to listen, that that means that's a way you can do it. Maybe one day Rich and I will, uh, you know, we'll get uh, brave enough and <laughs> enough spine to put it on camera, but we're not there yet. So, but that's still accessible. So we would encourage you to go to slavetotheking.com and then sign up as a follower of the page because as new content comes out, whether it's the podcast, new article, something like that, you'll get, you'll be the first to know as it comes right into your email. Y'all do still know how to use email, right? I mean, some of us still have to use email. It's it's kind of a necessity, <laughs> but it's a way for you to be kept informed, especially as the weird things continue to happen with social media, Google, and all these other resources out there that tend to try to push off from the internet anything that is honoring to God. This is a good way for you to at least have access directly to everything we put out and a way to contact us. It also has the way that if you choose to support the program, you can. Uh, there is a Patreon link there. Um, maybe one of these days I'll figure out how to make Patreon something's a bit more inviting, giving you additional content, but we haven't gotten there yet either. Look, I'm retiring from my current career in 189 days. I hopefully by then have some have more free time where I can do some of this stuff. But at least that's a way you can support if you choose. Uh, before you do that, support your church, support your family, uh, take care of your responsibilities. And then, if the Lord allows you, if you want to find a way to help support that program, this is one way you can do it. Another way is there is a link to the doctrineandlife.co website where you can actually get some merchandise that is uh, for the show, from t-shirts and, and stickers primarily. And what that does is, it's it, while we're not really making any money off of that, um, it, it is a way that they can, we can put uh, products out there for you guys, which then can be worn like our good friend Eki Tepsaporn Chai from Truth Be Known Radio did while he and his wife were on vacation and was uh, sporting some VOR swag while he went out to dinner one night. Thank you, Eki. That was really nice of you to do. Really appreciate that. And uh, that's a way you can support the show because it can, it can be one of those little conversation pieces. Hey, what's that? You know, what, what is this, uh, you know, the shirt you're wearing? So it's a way you can support the program. So we would appreciate it if you consider doing that as well. So those are kind of the, the preliminaries. We always want to get that out of the way. We always invite you guys. If you have ideas for the program, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us at voiceofreasonradio at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to contact us via social media, most of the, you guys follow us on there. But like I said, you can also go to the website, find the social media for uh, both the Twitter and Facebook accounts for VOR, and you can contact us that way. If you have questions, comments, concerns, we'd love to hear from you. Occasionally, we will get some sort of weird, uh, I, I don't know, a bot email, some sort of weird off-the-wall, dude, you're going way too far into the conspiracy theory stuff. That's It's pretty rare. So we're pretty, we're pretty safe with the idea of you guys reaching out to us. But if you do have concerns, if you do even disagree with us, just be respectful in that. That's what we, all we would ask. And... Um, Make sure you're bringing your Bible verses in context if you if you want to contend with that. We don't really run into a problem with that too often, but if it does come up, you know, we just want you to want to kind of lay that groundwork for that. So again, those are all the preliminaries. We try to get those out at the beginning of each show because we want you to know how you can find us and how you can share that with others. The best way you can, by the way, you can always support the program is two ways. Number one, pray for us. We always would appreciate prayer. We desperately need it. We're just like you. We're uh, we're knuckleheads that <laughs> constantly do things wrong and, and need the, the grace of Christ to bring us uh, back into correction and walking the right way. So your prayers are always appreciated. And the other way is to share the program. If you find anything useful in this program, we ask that you consider sharing it. Not so it gets bigger or gets more numbers or anything like that, but so that others may fi find some benefit in it as well. And we do occasionally see you guys doing that, so we're really, really appreciative for it. Okay, so what are we doing tonight? Normally, Rich and I will sit down with a particular topic and uh, go over a bit in depth over things. Now, last week was kind of fun, uh, and apparently a lot of you did find it interesting. You, a lot of you still tuned in, 
even though it was really one of our uh, more off the wall podcast episodes, um, I, I I think <laughs> it was not one of those things that we went into going, oh, we've got to do this. It was like, as Rich said, it, it really kind of stemmed out of a discussion, just a fun discussion about those things that go bump in the night. If you haven't listened to it, if you want to have a little bit of fun, I uh, encourage you to go to you know go to our podcast page or go to slavesofthekingcom and p- pick up last week's program. It, it's it's uh, primary title is things that goes bump in the night and it's about Bigfoot and UFOs and ghosts and goblins and what does the Bible really have to say? And it was really kind of our take on what is all this stuff? Is there any validity to it? And and hopefully what we did is maybe encourage you to think critically, not to just be. Uh, a complete scoffer on one end or a complete true believer on the other, but to think critically and think biblically. And uh, hopefully that was helpful. I I know there was at least a couple of you that uh, commented about the program and actually found it very useful. And um, I'm glad I'm really am because (laughs) it was, it was one of our goofier programs. And, uh, and, and a lot of it was addressing that, you know, kind of the popular culture handling of these topics. And so, and just how bizarre and how in the left field this stuff can go it, and a complete abandonment of critical thinking. But at the same time, um, for, you can go too far the other direction and forget that you know, we actually live in a, in a universe that God has created. And outside of that is a, this spiritual world that is uh, primarily God and his kingdom. And in that are angels and demons that in some ways, interact with this world. Now, I don't think it's near as much as some people would try to claim. I think there are some folks that think that every creak of the floorboards, every <laughs> every snap of a twig in the uh, bushes, every strange light in the sky indicates that the demons are invading. I don't go that far at all. But it's certainly, it, we can't, um, we can't just simply say, as as the guys at Hanukkah Cosmos say, you know, we're not just, it's not just stuff. In other words, matter, physical world, scientific box kind of thing there's more to this universe and so there's always a reminder of that i think you have to straddle that uh, that path very uh, you have to be really on the on the beam and not go too far one way or the other so hopefully we we communicated that to you last week so bear with me i gotta gotta take a swig of water normally i have rich with me who's talking and i can take drinks in between you're gonna have to put up with that a little bit tonight <laughs> i appreciate your patience so what I wanted to do tonight was maybe couple just, a, couple, a couple of just smaller topics, things that um, maybe have been crossing my mind this last week, primarily maybe share, stuff that I've sh- shared on social media, such as Twitter, in hopes that maybe this is stuff that will get you to think about, you know, they're just points to ponder maybe, stuff that's been going on, stuff that I've encountered, and ways that you and I as Christians can address these issues. And so hopefully these little sub little subtopics maybe and little uh, mini topics will be things that will be helpful to you. So let's dive into this. So I'll start with the first one because really it's the big kind of story going on in in social media, but not just social media. It's also going on in, in the news and in politics, and it's become a, a very big talking point. And what what am I talking about? I'm talking about Representative Nancy Mace. Now she is a Republican. Uh, member of the House and uh, you know federal uh, House representatives, she was at a um, a prayer breakfast that was going on in Washington, put on by Senator Tim Scott. Um, Representative Mace. Some people have said she didn't read the room very well. I think that's a mild way of putting it. Um, I don't want to play the clip because it's not overly salacious, but it's very inappropriate. Even if the woman happens to be married, or whether this was a man or a woman is irrelevant, um, even if she was married, I still don't think how she related this t- uh, account was wise in any way, shape, or form. But she's not married. She's engaged. And what she did is she started off by uh, you know, thanking Senator Tim Scott for putting on the prayer of breakfast and how she had wanted to be there early and be on time for this, and basically explained that when she got up to get up early and get ready to go, her fiance, with whom she cohabitates, tried to pull her back into bed for intimate relations. Let's just put it that way. And how she basically said no because we had she had to be at the prayer breakfast and how that was her priority. And and she made a joke about how she'll, you know, she'll be back together with him later so he can wait. It was said in a manner that was a attempted an attempt at humor. 
and it was extremely inappropriate given the nature of this meeting of, pe of people. Uh, I think what really made me, uh, was really heartbreaking was to hear the laughter as she's kind of trying to tell this, uh, what she believes is a humorous account. But this is what she gave up in order to be at the prayer breakfast on time. That's how important this was to her. And a lot of people I, rightly became very uncomfortable with, with this and called her out on it. Because why? What are you there for? You are there for a prayer breakfast. In other words, a gathering of people in Washington, D.C. for the specific point of meeting to pray for the nation, for the government, for the people who are our representatives, to rightly make decisions, all of those things. To, in other words, you are meeting together to pray to God whom you claim to follow, and you're talking about in order to make sure you are on time for this, you gave up, well, let's call it what the Bible calls it, fornication. Fornication is you are not married to this person, but you are engaged in intimate relations with this person. The Bible calls that a sin. And that's serious stuff. And so Representative Mace basically said, I chose not to sin, actively act on this sin in order to be here, even though I will engage in that sin later and I don't see it as a sin because that's my fiance and thank you for letting me be here and going on with the th uh, her talk. Um, a lot of people pointed out that this, this, was, this was disturbing. This was concerning that someone so callously approached the issue of sexual intimacy, which scripture confines to one man and one woman in a lifelong monogamous relationship called marriage. That's what is confined to. And Representative Mace just made a joke out of, of, of sinning at a prayer breakfast. So a lot of people, um, I think, as I said, rightly pointed out that this was not only just in poor taste, but just an admission of sin and absolutely inappropriate to have said such a thing or be engaged in such an act, especially when you're talking to people of the faith. The thing that I found very concerning about it is as, as people responded, um, Representative Mace didn't, didn't stop and go, hmm, I, I wonder if maybe this was a bad idea. She doesn't engage in any kind of act of contrition. No apologies, no um, no expression of, wow, I didn't even read the room right. This was the worst place to have said something like this. I should have been uh, more careful. Nothing of that nature. In fact, as the pushback came around, she states on her Twitter account, I go to church because I'm a sinner, not a saint. Glad those in, in, in attendance, including Senator Tim Scott and my pastor, her pastor was in attendance, took the joke in stride. Pastor Greg and I have extra to talk about on Sunday. Laugh emoji. So she took it. She, she believes that there's no reason whatsoever that anybody could have taken this, should have or seen this as anything more than a joke. I mean, the other senator, he got it. My own pastor got it, she says. And so she and the pastor will have a chuckle at church on Sunday all about it. And this is what I want to hopefully you know, help you think about as we, we look at something like this, because there's a lot of comments. Um, it, it, the interesting was some of the comments I got back in response to this, but this is what I want you to think about when we see something like this. The first and foremost thing is that she can't even see this as an issue. Okay, understand this. Representative Nancy Mace doesn't see this as an issue at all. The idea of cohabitating with a man who is not her husband, at least not yet, in, in a, and is engaged in an intimate relationship with someone who is not yet her husband, she doesn't believe it's sinful. She doesn't believe it's a problem. And her pastor doesn't apparently think it's a problem. That's concerning. So she sees no issue whatsoever while at a prayer breakfast confessing or admitting to being in a sinful living arrangement. This is the kind of thing that if, if you're a pastor 
Pastor Greg, shame on you. If you're a pastor and you have someone attending church who you know is actively living in an unrepentant lifestyle of sin, in other words, living with another person with whom is not their spouse and is engaged in immoral sexual behavior with this person, and that church makes no attempt whatsoever to correct this, shame on that church. Shame on that church. What you have said is you are more concerned about having a person who is a sitting representative in, in, uh, you know, in the House, in Congress, attending your church, than actually caring about her soul. Or you're more concerned about the acceptability of your of your church and getting people to come, you know, come in and, and feel accepted and, and loved. So we're not going to address sin. Shame on that church. Shame on Pastor Greg. But that tells you that a person who attends church, who has a pastor over her, is living in, in this unrepentant lifestyle of sin and sees zero problem with it. That should be concern number one. We should be deeply concerned for Representative Nancy Mace. It, it's funny because we get a, what's, it, when I shared my comments about this yesterday, at last check, uh, it had been seen over nearly 63,000 times with uh, over 400 plus likes uh, shared multi, like you know tens uh, tens and tens of times like 40 oh, here it is 44 retweets and and five quote tweets this thing I posted generally speaking very much in agreement which I'm grateful for um, and always a little worried about uh, putting something out into the public sphere for Christianities that says this is wrong and uh, what the response will be. Now, I have had some interesting responses back as of this morning. The uh, how dare you crowd finally woke up yesterday or, or sometime overnight and started uh, peppering my account. But it, what's funny is watching the world that says, oh, you terrible Christians, you you always speak against, uh, you know, the sexually immoral group known as LGBTQIA+, plus whatever we're at now. But I never hear you talk about adultery. Never hear you about talk about fornication. Uh, could it be because you don't really have a problem with sex? It's just you don't like that one, so it's icky. So you you, you know that's your problem. Well, <laughs> a bunch of us responded to Representative Mace, whose sin is just as bad as everything that LGBTQIA plus whatever. Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm not trying to be snippy. I, I can't keep track. Um, it's just as sinful. What she's doing, it's an open admission of an unrepentant lifestyle of sin. And so we comment on it and the how dare you crowd lost their minds. <laughs> it's like, you can't, you can't win. I, I, that's another issue I'll address in just a minute. But um, getting back to this. So that was the first thing is here's a person who Christians are voting for because she's a Republican. Because, right, that's what happens, right? You, as uh, Todd Friel would say, you become a Christian, you get a gun, you vote Republican, you watch Fox News, right? That, that's Or now it's you just follow Tucker Carlson wherever he went. That, that's, what, that's what makes us Christians, right? No, it doesn't. But that's kind of what is assumed. And Representative Mace, and, uh, you know, living in an unrepentant lifestyle of sin, still expects Republic, you know, Christians to vote for her because she's a Republican. And so... There's that concern is that here is a person who believes that evangelicals should not have a problem with this. And what, why would she have that? Well, first of all, first of all, her, her church is doing her no favors. They are doing nothing to, to bring her into a, a right standing with Christ, to bring her about to a repentance and, 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 and disciplining her for what she's doing in, in open rebellion to God. That's the first issue. But the other is that Sexual immorality of this nature has become so the norm in American culture and, and really around the world in so many places, uh, primarily in, in Western culture, that people just don't think it's a problem. I, I, I still remember when I got engaged to my wife, I, I was a fairly new Christian at the time, I'd been a Christian about a year or uh, we had met shortly after we both came became Christians and we got married a little over a year later. And um, people confused at why we weren't living together, why we were not in um, intimate relations together. Because, you know, we both worked in environments where we, we um, worked with secular people and they were mystified by why we weren't that way. Why? Because culture in general says, 
you, you, you test drive, right? You, you, go, you live together, you engage in sexual intimacy together because it's like a test drive. You learn to make sure that this is a person whom you will be satisfied with. It's that predominant, and it's become predominant even within Christian circles. It's, it's an ongoing issue even w- within the evangelical church is that you have people who are cohabitating, people who are engaged in intimacy, who have not made a promise uh, before God to love, honor, cherish, and serve one another until, until death do they part. They're just, nope, this is what we do. And it's it's that callousness, that, that seared conscience that our culture is so awash in that leads to someone who can publicly say in a setting that is predominantly religious people that she's sinning, make a joke about it, and not understand why it bothered anybody. That, that, that's a testimony to the nature of our culture. That's just how far it's gone. Now, from what I understand, Representative Mace even appeared on Sean Hannity's show on Fox News, and he passed it off as no big deal. Sean Hannity is supposed to be a Catholic. <laughs> now, Catholic Catholicism is not Christian, and that's a discussion for another time we should probably get into. But they still have the Bible. They still understand sin. This should be still something he, uh, he gets, but Sean Hannity is a compromised, secular, uh, you know, news commentator who sides with, cons- you know, well, he says he's a conservative first. With all due respect, Sean, you're a Republican. You're not a conservative. You always go Republican, and you never give the Republicans a hard time, in my opinion. So he's a Republican, and then somewhere in there is his Catholic face. Excuse me, I say faith, faith, Catholic faith. But he passed it over. That just tells you how callous the uh, the the Western uh, the Western culture in particular, but in our nation, how calloused our culture has and, and uh, inoculated our culture has become uh, become against the Word of God. Just don't see it as an issue. We we just don't. We, it's so normal. Why would you? Why would this bother you? Now here's a person who says she's going to have to talk to more to her pastor on Sunday and she thinks it's a joke but she's a professing Christian well that's concerning because if we as professing Christians have so little reverence for the word of God so little desire to pursue holiness or righteousness so care so very little about offending the God that we came to uh, claim to follow how can we call ourselves Christians? Now, we get it. We don't do good things in order to be in right standing with God. As we've talked about on the show, and there's an episode to this where we talk about this, if we are in Christ, we are new creations and dwelt by the Holy Spirit with a new heart and a new desire, a set of desires to where we des- want to, we desire to obey God and where we will step down and fall and crash into ditches, we climb back up because by God's grace we are driven back into repentance. There's none of that here. There's none of that coming from Representative Mace. None at all. At least that we that she's saying publicly. There was a couple other comments uh, on her Twitter account, and I won't get into those, but it indicating she just doesn't see it as a problem. She joked about how her fiancé said, well, maybe you should go to church twice on Sunday. To make up for it, as if that somehow eradicates the fact that she's still cohabitating and still engaged in this, you know, illicit relationship with someone who is not her husband yet. Um, so there's no indication from her that she's recognizing what she's doing is wrong. It is that seared conscience, not even a twinge of guilt, coming from her or those around her. She should have people who are close to her, if that are also Christians, speaking to her about this. But nobody will. Why? Because we're more concerned about winning political victories. And that's why Sean Hannity didn't make an issue of it. That's why Sean Hannity said, good for you. And uh, you know, glad she was participating in this prayer breakfast. But it is an utter uh, spitting in God's face to it openly admit to a room of people that you are engaged in ongoing unrepentant sin and then say, by the way, let's pray. Let's pray for this. Let's pray for that. Why on earth would you expect God to hear your prayers? Rather than, Lord, forgive me a sinner. Lord, lead me me in right ways. 
Now, this is where we as Christians need to remember with whom we align ourselves. Scripture tells us not to be unevenly yoked. And we normally think about that in terms of marriage, which is a, a perfectly applicable, uh, a perfect application for that. But we also talk about in terms of in the public sphere, in the, uh, in the public square, in business and such. We don't partner with those who reject the word of God and reject God's rule over their life because it will bring us some sort of benefit. It, if we certainly don't do that in, mar- in our marriage, our closest relationship in our marriage, then we shouldn't be doing it in uh, other associations as well. Now, obviously, when it comes to the issue of politics and whom we elect, we're not going to pick anybody who's perfect. You're going to have to make choices about who your vote goes to, and that should be informed by with all the policies and, and things that we're looking at and, and the things that are coming up and the challenges that are being met for the nation of the, ch- of the available candidates, who cl- most closely aligns with that. Sometimes that's going to be none of the above. Okay. I'm perfectly honest. There, there are sometimes there are candidate, you know, the candidates that are out there are so vile across the board that I don't believe as Christians, we can in good conscience, sometimes you have to vote none of the above. I, I genuinely believe that. Uh, I can't tell you who those are. I can't tell you when to do those things. You as a Christian have to make those determinations for yourself. But when we have cast our votes and we see the individuals with whom we have, we, these are our representatives and they're doing something like this, we now have to ask ourselves a question. If you want my vote as a Christian, how can I trust you to represent what I believe is right, when you will openly admit and make fun about my faith. When you will openly spit in the face of God and deny that he has rule and reign even over your intimate relationships. How can I trust you to make, to, to do what, I, what we're asking you to do when you go to Washington? I think that's something we have to be concerned with. It's a question we really need to ask ourselves because it is a political victory so important that we're now, and I'm not saying that people need to vote out Representative Nancy Mace. I, I, what they should be doing is calling her to repentance and calling her, uh, and praying for her and praying for genuine salvation for her. That's first and foremost. I would encourage everybody to be praying for Representative Mace. This is not a, um, a shame on you. We're better than you for Representative Mace. Every Christian struggles with sin. All of us do, but unrepentant sin. An admission of and joking about and just a, a dismissal of anybody who calls you on it is very concerning, especially when you did so in an environment where it was the worst possible place imaginable to do it. Um, but we as Christians need to think about who, with whom are we partnering and why is political victory so important that we're not talking about somebody who has a checkered past and is now doing their best to live a, a, a an God honoring life, for example, we're talking about somebody who's claiming to be a Christian but defying the Word of God openly. A lot of people have tried to say, "Oh, well, you guys voted for Trump." Now, if you guys listened to this program back in 2016, Rich and I expressed genuine concern, and we really didn't want to see anybody voting for Trump because of his past exploits. And I don't even like to use that in, in, in any kind of positive term. And we believed it it was testimony to his character. Now, from 2016 to 2020, we were willing to say, even though he had this horrible past, what he did as president, we're not saying that he was did, did nothing wrong as president, is that he honored what he said he was going to do, and it had positive impact on the nation. So it was like, okay, where are we at with him now versus the person that so many people point back to? And that that was part of what factored in. And maybe Representative Mace will, you know, repent of this. Maybe she'll, this will push them to get married sooner, so at least they're not in a sinful, ongoing relationship. And maybe she will honor God with the things He intends her to do, even though this is an issue she still needs to repent of. Don't know. That's that will remain to be seen. But I think it should be something where we should say. With whom are we uniting ourselves? With whom are we allowing to be, uh, are allowing ourselves to be a demographic they can just count on? 
I think that's something that every Christian needs to ask themselves. Um, I don't think it should be a hard and fast rule. I think there is a hard and fast rule when it comes to the other side of the aisle, when you're talking about Democrats whose stated platform is to basically reject everything that the Word of God says and, a, and promote everything that the Bible says is a sin as some sort of virtue and a platform that they need to uphold. I don't think we can. I think it's pretty safe to say, uh, unless you are dealing with a very, very rare exception, um, and there, I know there are some out there that, generally speaking, you just we can't endorse a, po a, a political party that says everything the Bible says is sin. That's what we're for. That we're going to promote that. You know, baby murder, uh, sexual immorality. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> wars upon wars, whatever. You know, uh, you know, stealing people from money and calling it wealth redistribution. Uh, promoting racism by saying that uh, certain. You know, certain ethnic backgrounds are basically sinless, and other sinless, ba other ethnic backgrounds are guilty of every sin, and there are evil beyond, uh, you know, description. I think you cannot unite yourself to that at all. But when we're talking about the rest of the political spectrum, you you have to start thinking about what do they stand for, what are they promoting, and then am I going to be it just a voting block to them that they can count on, and they can just rub my face in the dirt about what I believe. I think we need to be very concerned about that. And I think that's what this ish, ish, uh, situation happened here. I think that was a, a good example of that. Now, again, it was it was interesting how the how dare you crowd kind of came out. Um, I had several people who tried to say that, could try to pull the judge knot. Um, we've talked about it on this show. I'm not going to get into that discussion. But I actually had some people say, well, it's not a sin to to uh, be engaged in sexual relations with your fiance that's not adultery therefore it's not sin uh who, who how dare you say that she was sinning and the simple fact is the scripture is very clear about that that uh sexual intimacy is specifically for a husband and wife in that lifetime uh, monogamous relationship called marriage and that's the only place that scripture uh, approves of it. the the funny thing is that i actually had one individual who said that uh, the Bible's totally fine with, even if you're married, be sleeping with other women as long as they're not married to somebody else. I, I'm not kidding. This was a response. And the best I can assume that he was getting to was talking about um, the, the Old Testament's description of various persons who had multiple wives. And as I explained to him, and I, need, I want to explain to you guys, we need to understand that there is a difference between what's called descriptive passages and prescriptive passages. So I'll touch on that and then we're going to we'll move on to another topic real quick. Descriptive passages tell us what happened. It doesn't just because it's described doesn't mean that it is acceptable in the eyes of God. It just simply said and it, it's not saying that this is something that should be pra practiced. For example, King David had an entire harem, had multiple wives and then went one step beyond that and you know uh committed adultery with Bathsheba, which led to the murder of Uriah. Um, and note, I said, committed adultery with Bathsheba. I did not say that David raped Bathsheba. Another topic for another time. But uh, the thing is, is as, as I shared with this individual, that was a description of what David did, what David and other kings did, but it does not prescribe it. In fact, when we go to Deuteronomy, I think it's 1717, it tells, uh, it tells the, the uh, Israel that when they set up kings, because they would, um, that that king was not to multiply wives unto themselves, unto, unto himself. Uh, neither was he to seek after, you know, vast gold and silver. Uh, why? Because it would lead them away from serving the Lord. So you, they were not to have, they were, they were to have a wife. David sinned, that's described. Scripture says, one man, one woman, that's prescribed. That's the difference. The scriptures are not shy about telling us about the sins of the historical people within the, its accounts. It has no problem telling us that and it has no problem telling us the consequences of those sins. If you read about David and all the things that he did, the man was, was a womanizer and it cost him multiple times. There were things that God constantly brought him back to repentance for. So David was a sinner like the rest of us, and his sins oftentimes were tied to this multiplication of wives and his terrible uh, work as a father because he wouldn't raise his sons the way he should, which is why Absalom, his own son, ousted him from the throne. Um, so 
the Bible will describe things, but it doesn't mean it prescribes. You have to look for what Scripture tells you you must do or must not do to understand uh, that it's a prescriptive pass, a passage. But if it describes something, it's not telling you it's okay to do it. It's just telling you this what is, is what happened. So, for example, if I tell you I went to the store today and I bought milk and I bought bread and I bought uh, body wash and I bought toothpaste, which are things that I did, am I telling you you need to go to the store and do this? No, I'm telling you I described for you what I did. But if I tell you, now if, if my wife was to say, uh, husband, here's a list, go get to go to the store and buy milk, buy bread, buy body wash, buy uh, toothpaste, she's giving me this prescriptive, go do this. See the difference? One tells you what to do, one describes what has happened. So we need to understand that when we're dealing with scripture. And when people try to use this and use this as a way to attack what you're saying, recognize where they're coming from. They're just saying, well, if it's in the Bible, it must be acceptable. They don't even understand the first thing about context. Okay, so let's move on from that. Since we're, since we're talking about social media and we're talking about interactions, let's, let's go on to something else that is social media related. One of the problems, and I, this was something I shared, I think, yesterday on Twitter, is one of the problems with social media is it is a particularly hard place to have these kind of discussions. Okay, why? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. We all recognize that it's very easy to get into Twitter or Facebook shouting matches, right? Um, you, you post something, somebody gets doesn't like what you said, they snark at you, you snark back, and this fight evolves, and later we're like, how did we get into this mess? What just happened? You know, I basically said, I like oranges, and somebody screamed at me about, you know, how uh, how I'm a, a Trump-loving, uh, constitution-worshipping MAGA nut. How do we get from A to B, you know, or in this case, A to Z? You know, we, we got so far off track. How did that happen? Well, social media is one of these things, and this is important as for us as Christians because it impacts how we interact with one another as Christians and how we represent ourselves to the world. We are people that we should be a gracious people with one another. Scripture constantly uh, tells us to be to, have, to come together for the unity of faith. We've talked about that. To be humble, to serve one another, to esteem one another is better than ourselves. To, uh, to speak in a manner in which we are edifying the body, in other words, building it up, not tearing it down. That we are to use our gifts for the edification of the body. I mean, over and over and over again, Scripture tells us that we are to be a people that elevate others above ourselves and, not, and the idea of getting into, into, into these disturbing, I, what's the word I could say? Just, I guess arguments is probably the best description for it. I want to say that another phrase, but it's escaping me. We get into these just shouting matches. And I think part of it is what social media by itself really is. Social, we, we, we want to have discussions. We're talking about we should have these discussions on important issues, which means we listen, we think about, and we interact with, that's a discussion, right? Discussion, discourse, debate, we're, we're, ta we're taking in, we're considering, we're responding to. That's how conversation works. We're, we're actually, if, if, you're, if you're having a conversation, if you're having a dialogue instead of a monologue, um, that's how it should work. But social media doesn't lend itself to that. Social media is really more like a guy on the on a street corner with a bullhorn screaming at the top of his lungs, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. Can you have a conversation with somebody if that's what you're doing? Of course not. You're too busy yelling into the megaphone, hear what I have to say. You need to hear what I am saying. You're not you're not concerned about listening if you're doing that. You're concerned about you know putting out there for other people to hear. So that's social media. That's what we do. When we log on to Twitter or Facebook or any of these other uh, social media alternatives, we are putting ourselves on display for other people to hear what we have to say. And so we're, we come in, when we log in, we're primed to be an announcer, not a discusser, right? I've come in to say, I went to, uh, you know, I went to the lake today and I had a wonderful time and here's the food we grilled and here's the fish I caught and that camping trip was wonderful. 
we're announcing to the world, right? Do I go into social media to say, I'm going to read what others have posted and learn about them today? Ah, you didn't think about that question, did you? Because I don't. I None of us do. We will scroll, 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 and we'll look at stuff, and we'll, we'll kind of give a passing glance, and something might catch our attention, and then we might interact with it. But generally, I've gone on because I want to be heard. I'm not really trying to learn about people, generally speaking. It doesn't mean we don't do that at all. It just means that, generally speaking, I've gone in there with a with the intent to be heard. I'm not there. Like, I, if I go to the you know these multitude of shelves that I have in my office that are double stacked deep with books... Hi, my name is Chris, and I'm a bookaholic. Uh, you know, and I grab a book off the shelf, am I, and I open it. Am I about to scream to the book and tell the book you need to listen to me? Of course not. I'm going to open the book and consume what the author has given me to, uh, to, to read, and I'm going to start considering and digesting and thinking about it. When I open my Bible, I don't scream at the Word of God. I, le- I let the Word of God penetrate my heart, mind, and soul. But when we go to social media, we do the exact opposite. We go in there primed to yell out to the world what we want heard. We're not there to consume. We might consume like snippets, but we're not there to generally learn, digest, and consider. We're not doing that. So we don't treat social media as a, as a, uh, a resource where we are learning things. We generally treat social media as a place where we're telling and be, wanting to be heard. So here's the problem with that. When we go in there demanding to be heard, and we let's just say we're having a, a, a we put out something theological, and I, I, I'm you know primarily, I guess I would identify as re, like a Reformed Baptist. It, I, I don't, I, the church I'm at doesn't say that, but that's probably what we were most closely aligned. And so I go on and I want to say that the doctrines of grace, what's called Calvinism, is the right way to understand salvation. So what do I do? I type up a quick post, shoot it off into the, the Twitter sphere, move on. I'm there posting what people know, I believe people need to hear from me. Along comes John Doe Arminian. And he disagrees with what I have to say. And so he responds back at me. Well, I just put this thing out there for you all to listen to. Somebody comes back and says, well, what about John 3.16? Most commonly cited (laughs) response to Calvinism. And they snap back, right? He hates Calvinism. I don't want to hear a response about a response to Calvinism. What, what, what What have we just done? Two monologues have crossed paths, right? And now he's saying something I don't want to listen to because I've heard this before and I'm tired of responding to it. And he's tired of people like me saying, uh, speaking about the, the sovereignty of God in salvation. So two immovable forces have, mo- or, or, or irresistible forces have meet, meet, uh, come and met up with two immovable objects. Now, I'm going to get snippy. I'm going to get irritated because, and, and it's, it's usually like, ugh, not again, you know, we just have this, this, contention that starts to build there and as a result of that now we're starting to go back and forth right oh john three sixteen. you know you need to read the entire passage you guys always do this well you know you guys just want you know uh, people to be autonomous drones and god is just a moral monster right we're back and forth because we're not there to consume and learn and listen we're there to shut each other down when we do so in this kind of knee-jerk reaction. And now what I need to do is get him to stop. And I, he needs to just understand he's wrong. And so we go back and forth. That's not the intention most of us have when we go on. You know, like I said, we can start with something entirely innocuous, like I like oranges. And somebody can come in and... Because how on earth can you not care about all these other fruits and vegetables. In fact, oranges are bad for you because of this, this, and this. Why don't you talk about that? I think you should talk about that. They may think they have the greatest of intentions, but what have they done? They've co-opted you to turn it into their discussion. Now, you're frustrated because they've, they've, they've taken something that was yours and turned it on for themselves, 
and now we're slowly back and forth and it's slowly building it's getting faster and it's getting more angry we want the flow of affirmation that's what we came there for we we came to say i like oranges and everybody goes yay oranges are fantastic and then somebody comes in and goes but apples are better oh for crying really dude you can't just let me post this you gotta you gotta bring up the issue of apples right and so i'm get we get into this us versus them uh mentality and we start trying to tear each other down because we didn't come in with a primary thinking of I'm there to read and learn. I, we came in there with the primary attitude, I'm here to announce. And now we're just getting more passionate and more ramped up. And we start tearing each other down. And, I, and I'm joking with the term uh, apples and oranges, but this will happen in a lot of different topics, whether it's politics, social issues, and, and for us as Christians, theological issues. I think one of the ways that we can help stop some of that now this little program and this little description isn't going to um solve that problem that's going to be an ongoing issue in social media for a long time to come but i think as christians one of the things that we can do is to think about how do i approach social media do i approach social media only as i'm the bullhorn on the corner and everybody hear me or do i go in there with like what am i going to learn from my friends today what am i going to learn from my family today Instead of the street corner where we're announcing from our soapbox, think of it like a fellowship hall. You guys come together uh, at, you know, at say the end of service, and you go and everybody goes into that fellowship hall and they have coffee and they're they're eating their their donuts or whatever cookies or whatever somebody brought, and we're having conversation, we're talking to each other, we're learning from each other, we're challenging one another. Right? Social media can be that. Instead of it being a place where we're just announcing, we can actually come together to learn from one another, to hear from one another. And be willing to digest what's being said, even when it's issues that we utterly disagree with. And by the way, I'm not talking about this nuance and winsomeness stuff, because that, that's a whole other issue that goes way off into left field, given the way some people present it. But what I'm saying is, just shift your thinking. Think about what it is you're coming in there for. If you're there to learn something, even if it's to learn to how a person you believe is wrong on an issue thinks on it, you're at least learning something and learning how to consider it, learning what they believe, and then responding to it in turn, rather than making it a shouting match because that's just terrible thinking. And let me tell you how you need to hear from me. I think if we do that, we can start beginning to process what other people are thinking and understand them in the context that they're providing and not going beyond what they mean. Now, I, I'll give you an example of this. I'm trying to keep this somewhat generic uh, because I don't, wanna, I, I don't want it to be about any people in particular. But I've seen conversations where, um, how's the best way I can explain this? A person may say um, that, you know, let's talk about husbands and wives. We did an episode on this. And they'll, they'll, they're coming in there with this kind of, uh, I want to explain that there needs to be this patriarchal understanding of how we lead our families. And he focuses on the husband's leadership in the home. And he says something that maybe is a little bit stiffer sounding than maybe it needed to be. And what happens? We come in and go, wow, that's a really bad take. Let me run back out here and tell everybody, this guy's got a really bad take about what it means to be a husband. And we all come rushing in and start telling him what his bad take about being a husband is, and he's going, that's not what I said. Yes, it is. No, what I'm saying is this. But no, that's not what you said. You said this. Are we letting this individual explain? No. We're telling him what he what he really meant, and then we're saying, oh, now you're backpedaling. Well, we need to think about, and I'll, I'll explain this in a minute, that we need to think about how we're, we're going into social media to make statements because sometimes we're our own worst enemy and we say things we ought not, ought not to have said because we're trying to condense it but when we enter into these conversations i've seen indicated situations where i read that and i went i know this guy i know what he's saying because i've had similar conversations with him before they're saying something totally different from what i think he means and i'm watching that conversation evolve and i'm going he's trying to tell them and they're denying it why? Because it's that shouting match. 
I'm not here to learn what you have to say. I'm not here to let you let you have context. I'm here to prove you're wrong. And that's something we need to think about is even when you're dealing with someone who you believe is not rightly handling the word of God, you still need to process it correctly. I, I'll give you an example. Um, a long time ago, uh, the current Pope had made a comment uh, of something that's uh, an effect of saying, from a basically uh, trying to say from a human perspective, it looked like Christ had failed when he di- was put on the cross. And everybody screamed, my God doesn't fail. And it was James White who came in and went, hold on a second. You know, while I don't believe, while I do believe that the this you know that this particular pope's a liberal nut job, that's not what he said. He said this, and everybody attacked James White. Why? Because everybody assigned a meaning that James White recognized was wrong, and he tried to correct it. We're we're not good at hearing because we want to jump on the bandwagon. Rethink how you approach social media. One other thing, when you go on social media, this is kind of the other side of the coin. When you go on and you want to talk about things, which is fine, use social media to talk about what interests you, what things are important to you, but think about how you put it out and how you receive uh, criticism and and critique. Social media is one of the, is not a medium like a book is. If I grabbed, um, I've got the three volumes of Reform Systematic Theology, they're just out of my reach right here from uh, Joel Beakey and Smalley, uh, volume one, two, and three. If I grab that book, it is chock full, or any of those books, I should say, um, chock full of information. And it's it's all got this deep explanation, meaning, and context, but you have to spend time in it. Social media tells us, well, we want things in bite-sized bullet point chunks that we can consume real fast. You know, it's this, it's this bumper sticker quick post, move on. And what ends up happening is we can result in, it can result in uh, something like these controversial posts or these hot takes is what we'll call them. And so we want to make this point. It's really important. God is sovereign in salvation, right? And so we'll, we'll post something that basically says God is sovereign in salvation. If you don't, if you don't believe, believe that, then you believe that uh, you know you believe in a God that you know can fail, and you just leave it at that, right? That's a hot take. What is it meant to do? It conveys a certain amount of truth. God is sovereign in salvation. If we assign to God that He has to give over to us to make the choices, and He's trying really hard to get us to make a decision for Christ, but we can resist Him, and so therefore, if we resist His will, we have a God who fails. That's a little bit more explained. Now, there's a lot more to that, okay? But if we just do this, God is sovereign, you're not. If you believe otherwise, you believe in a God who fails. That's a hot take. That is a lot of heat, a lot of light. It's kind of like an, an M80 went off <laughs> you know, in your hands, and then, boom, off you go. It's meant to you know, convey a, a, a point, but it, can, it also lends itself to a lot of misunderstanding. Why? Because we haven't, we have not expounded on this. We have not made a lot of description of this. We have not sat down and worked through the various passages that explain this. Now, I know that's difficult to do because social media is, even with, uh, you know, I pay the $8 a month so that I can get the, the longer uh, ability to post on Twitter. Um, maybe I'll continue to do that. Maybe I won't. I don't know yet. Because I like to explain myself. Short and pithy is difficult for me. I, I'm not good at that. I, I believe in when I write, I need to build a case. Now, that comes from 24 and a half years of law enforcement experience where you write a report to make a case. Um, that's just what I do. And so the idea of being short and pithy doesn't work well for me because I have to build a case. But I see this happen so often in social media. And what happens is you create the perfect storm where people... Not having enough context, where the, and, and you know, take it out of the realm of the of the soteriology. Put that aside. Now we're not talking about that. But you make a post that's explosive. It's meant to catch attention. It lacks context. It lacks proper hermeneutics and ex- exegesis. Even though there's all of it's there to make that case, it's just it's eye catching. And now because I'm not making my case, I've just thrown out an assertion and moved on, 
people can come in and start attributing wrong intent, wrong motivation. They uh, they can say that uh, I'm just trying to uh, push an agenda. Um, uh, well, what you really mean is this. No, no, that's not what I meant. Yes, it is because you said this. And they can start assigning their own interpretation of what you meant and why because there's a lack of clarity. Now, I don't believe that every single discussion needs or every single post needs this long um, poetic explanation. It, it doesn't have to be a magnum opus. But what I'm saying is if you throw out a hot take, you, you are actually creating the environment where misrepresentation and misunderstanding can happen. So if you're one of these people, and I see this a lot, well, everybody's just attacking me. Every time I post something, everybody attacks me. It's pick on me day. You know, uh, they, you know they, everybody just, see, is, just seems to be intent on misrepresenting me. Well, if you do that a lot, maybe you need to consider what you're putting out, right? Are you putting out content that thoroughly explains what you mean? And are you willing to receive critique and correction? Are you willing to you know, receive how people read what you post and go, man, you know, if I was somebody who didn't understand this, I could see where they're coming from. Now, here's the problem with that. We don't like doing that. Why? Because we're then saying, well, the person who's getting, who's getting upset with me may have a point and I can't give them ground. We do this a lot. You go back to the um, soteriology debate. Let's pull that back off the shelf for a second. And as, as someone who is a, a, a strong believer in doctrines of grace, and by the way, most of my Christian walk, I did not believe that, um, that came later in my walk through the study of scripture. Guess what? I have John Calvin's Institute sitting on my desk right next to me, and the binding has not been cracked. <laughs> I've never read Calvin, okay? Um, but I, I learned it from, from the scriptures. And so I'm going to address it, hopefully, from the scriptures. Um, but we bring that back in, and we go, well, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Calvinist, and every Arminian is wrong. So somebody comes in, and I've made a post that because of my own failing to explain myself well, not that they've purposely misunderstood me or misrepresented me, because sometimes that that, that really does happen, by the way. Uh, I, I fully admit and acknowledge that that happens. Um, there are some people that no matter how hard you do, you try to describe what you are, you know, what you are trying to put out and how well you qualify everything, you, you can die a death of a thousand paper cuts trying to to qualify stuff so people understand. And you're always going to have that person that says, oh, so what you really mean is God is a moral monster. Uh, you know, when people do that, here's my recommendation. Dust off your feet, move on. <laughs> There's a thing, to, you know, these great things called mute, block, unfriend, unfollow. There's ways to do that. You don't have to fight, uh, show up to every fight you're invited to. Channeling uh, Rich here. So, but if you have put out something that's controversial, that lacks the explanation, to draw attention to your latest article, your latest podcast, or to draw attention to this particular uh, pet theological issue, and you put out a hot take, you're setting up that storm. And if people come after you, stop and be willing to listen. That we really need to do that. Not every kerfuffle that erupts online is because people are attacking you. Sometimes you didn't do a good job explaining yourself. You made assumptions. You made assumptions of the the, the content of what you're putting out. You made assumptions about your list, readers or listeners. You uh, you made assumptions that the medium, such as Twitter or Facebook, didn't ha that, that those limitations wouldn't present a problem. And so in the end, you may have caused a problem for yourself by being unclear and then being unwilling to receive critique and correction. We all have areas that we can do better. Even if you are dead sound on your theological premise, but you don't explain something well, if people give you heat about it, you might want to go, well, I know I'm right on this issue, but boy, if I didn't explain it well, there could be a problem with me. And so let me think about what they're saying. If you're unwilling to do that, then you are just as guilty as mis for misrepresenting God as somebody who has their theology wrong and, and goes out of their way to promote wrong theology because you're not willing to take critique on how to refine yourself to make the pre presentation better. Not Now, do not hear what I did not say. Okay, 
don't hear me saying it's always your fault. You just always do a bad job. Did not say that at all. What I did say is there are times when all of us, all of us don't do a great job explaining something, haven't laid the foundation from posts in the past, have not been willing to listen to what other people say to help me refine how I uh, put something out. There are times we all do it and we put, we drop a bomb and then get upset because there's a big mess that I have to clean up. Well, if you made the mess, then be willing to clean it up and help others do so. Um, be willing to receive criticism. Be willing to receive critique. If a brother and sister comes along to you, and I'm not talking, again, I'm not talking about the internet troll that shows up out of nowhere like the guy that did to me today and um, just goes, well, you know, you you guys are always concerned about this, this, and this, and yet all, you know, when it comes to sexual immorality and, and, and uh, sex outside of marriage, but most of you all are, are completely divorced people and living in sinful uh, relationships, so this doesn't matter. Guess what? I'm not talking to you, okay? You're always going to have the troll. You're always going to have somebody who goes out of their way to misunder misunderstand and misrepresent. I'm not saying that those guys don't exist. I'm not saying those circumstances don't exist. And I'm not saying that every critique and correction is warranted. I think there's a lot of times that all of us are really bad about not giving grace to our brothers, our brothers and sisters online. That's one last thing I'd like to say is show some grace. You know you've said things that could have been said better. Show some grace to the guy who said something bad. Be willing to engage him and listen. You know, so listen from him as well. So I think if you do those things as Christians, we're going to be a lot more gracious people, and we're going to be able to maybe stem some of the tide of the arguments that don't need to happen. Um. I would just encourage you, hopefully that will help you out, again, because as Christians, we are people that are called to love our brethren as ourselves, we are to love, you know, to esteem them higher than ourselves, we're to use our gifts and our callings for the edification of the body, we're to, we're, and by the way, edification, is, correction is part of that. We don't always say high and lofty things to make people feel better. Sometimes we have to bring correction to bring somebody in right standing, to bring someone, to reconcile someone, etc. Sometimes we need to be willing to do that too. But we can be passionate, we can be firm, we can be loving without going out of our way to just be nuts because I think we all do that. So uh, I want to wrap, wrap this up with one last thought for you guys. And I think this is a show that Rich and I want to, want to talk about probably a little, a little more at length. And it was a, something as I've been going through, I, I've been reading uh, Philippians, I've been reading Ephesians, uh, and, and other passages uh, that it, this has jumped out to me. And I just want to leave you with a thought, and maybe we'll cover this on the next show or, or a future show. And that is, Scripture calls us to humble servitude, right? We are humble servants of the Most High God. We are not here for ourselves. We are here for him. We are here to serve a new master. We once served ourselves by really being enslaved to sin. And what that brings about is death. Well, now we have a new master. We have Christ, and he is the one to whom we point the world. That's our job. We are servants to the Most High Lord Jesus Christ. And so our job is to use the gifts and the callings for him, for his purposes, and to do so as signposts to the world saying, he's the one that you need to look to. We are to make much of him and be satisfied with just being that signpost. You, know, you go to Luke chapter 17 and um, he's talking about certain, you know, uh, this, this issue. Well, let's, we'll start with uh, chapter 5, or, excuse me, 17 verse 5. He says to the apostle, The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. This idea of genuine faith in Christ, submitting to him, trusting completely in him. And then he says, verse 7, Will any, of you, any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, come in at once and recline at table. Will you not? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you will eat and drink. 
Does he thank the servant because he did what it was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are un unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. We are called to as unworthy servants. We are these people who do not deserve the, the, the grace of, and mercy of salvation that we have received. We have been made joint heirs with Christ. We've been adopted into the family of God, but we are also called to be servants, to be slaves to God, to slaves to Christ. Paul would constantly in his letters say, a servant, a doulos, a bondservant or slave of Christ, because he understood his standing. He counted, he, he, he would love to say, I, if you think you guys are so great, let me tell you about my pedigree. Now, I chuck it all out. I count it as dung. It's garbage. It's worthless for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. That's what he would say. He recognized all the things that he could, was esteemed for were worthless. They were useless. They meant nothing because it, did, it changed nothing about his standing with Christ. Yet in Christ, as a servant, as a slave, that was worth more than anything the world could have to offer. If you want to test where you are with this, if you want to test whether God has worked humility or needs to, you need to work on being humbled by him, I need, ask yourself a question. If you had, could no longer have a public voice of any kind, like the platform that we talk about, like if, if, if Twitter was taken away, if social media was taken away, if uh, blogging or YouTube or podcasting was taken away from you, and the only thing you could do, you couldn't be the Sunday school teacher anymore, you couldn't uh, teach uh, you know, classes for the, the young couples, you couldn't do anything, but you could be a ditch digger for the Lord, for his glory. You could be the janitor that nobody knows about because they're not there during the week for the church. If you could do the one thing that nobody would recognize that you were doing it, but you could do it for the glory of God, would you be willing and be satisfied to do it? That's a big question we all should ask ourselves. Can I simply be a ditch digger, digger for the glory of God? To where nobody knows my name, nobody knows what I'm doing, but I'm digging this ditch and I'm doing it as well as I can because I'm satisfied in serving him alone. See, one of the problems, and you talk, going back to the social media thing for a second, is that social media has kind of gives this, this huge uh, ego of sorts. Because we think everybody can hear what I have to say. If that was all taken from you, if nobody would listen, you were never, you were in no position to do anything that anybody could recognize, but you were to serve the Lord in that capacity, would you be willing to do it and would you be satisfied to? Would you be joyful to? I think it's a great thing that we have things like social media and, and digital technology that makes the ability to reach around the world with the gospel just an amazing tool. But if none of us could use it ever again, if we could never be recognized for anything ever again, could we do what Christ command us and say, I'm going to go do what God told me to do. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, even if nobody sees it, nobody knows about it, nobody's heard of it. But I'm going to go do that work and I'm going to be joyful and satisfied for the, because I'm glorifying God. Could you do it? I think that's a really big question that a lot of us need to answer. I know I've been guilty of that. You know, in some capacity, I've, I've been a Christian for, oh, let's see, I was saved in 2000, so this is 2023, coming up on 23 years. Um, it was about September-ish, I think, is when that happened. So coming up on 23 years here. In probably, let's say, 15 of it, I've done blogging, I've done YouTube videos, I've done podcasting, I've done a lot, I've done street witnessing, I, I've done a lot of different things that put me, most often on a, on a lower scale, still putting me in some level of public sphere. And if God took that away from me tomorrow, 
that would be really hard because it's part of who I've become. So that's a difficult question to answer, but I would love to say without hesitations, oh yeah, absolutely, sure, go make me a ditch digger, Lord. But if I did, would, would I struggle with it? And, and I think if I'm being honest, I think there would be part of me that would, would struggle with it. But it's like, Lord, but I've done all this for so many years. Why are you taking it away? Right? And throughout those years, there have been times that I've always, always want to do this because I want to make much of Christ who saved me. But there's this nagging desire for that little bit of spotlight, right? We all do that. We, we want people to hit likes on our posts. We want people to share the things that we post. Um, we, we want, if you write it, you want people to read it. If you put a video, you want people to watch it. And so there's that desire. It's like, are, are you willing to do something? And if nobody saw it, would you still be satisfied for serving the Lord? When you work in this kind of environment, that is a challenge. When you do this, that is a challenge. Because you want to do it for Christ, but you still want to see those likes go up. And so there's that huge temptation to make it about yourself. And, and I, I will confess, I've struggled with that many, many times. Brethren who know me personally, who, with whom I've had conversations, know the, that I've discussed that struggle. You know, And there were times where I would get frustrated and the Lord would just go in, in my timing and to the people that I want uh, this to go to. And I've learned through trial and error to accept that. But that doesn't mean that I can't be tempted by it. And believe me, it happens. So my question to you is, are you tempted to even just a tiny, tiny bit of that glory? Even a little tiny bit of recognition? Or can you say, if nobody knew I existed, but I was digging a ditch for the Lord, I'm satisfied. That's a test of our humility before the Lord. And I think we really, really all need to do that. So hopefully, just a few little mini topics. Hopefully these have been helpful to you. Um, I, I think that in some vein, they all kind of point to the same thing, is that what we do should always be a pursuit of righteousness and holiness before the Lord. So if I could encapsulate all these three mini topics into one, everything that we do should be about, am I honoring God? Am I willing to honor God in my obedience? in my relationships, in my intimate relationships? Am I willing to be honoring to God in my social media conversations? And am I willing to honor God by just being a humble servant? Three many topics, kind of all coming back to that same question. Am I willing to honor God? So hopefully, hopefully this has all been helpful to you. Um, I'm sorry that Rich couldn't be here. Again, I ask that you pray for him. Pray for his health. It's, he, he, it's, he has challenges that I think sometimes, like heat in the summer and, 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 and stuff can make it worse and or make it feel worse. And um, just like everybody else, we, we all have family issues that come up. We have uh, personal matters in our life that must take precedence. And then in just this particular situation, um, it's the poor guy needs to get rest. <laughs> Let's just say that. So pray for him. Pray that uh, the Lord would give him the rest he needs and that he would comfort him in his, uh, in his dealing with that issue, uh, both physically and emotionally and mentally. Uh, look forward to being back with you guys next week. Again, if you he if there's anything about this program that you have questions about, anything that you want to share or you want to ask, uh, you know, you have concerns, g give us a shout. You know, Voice of Reason Radio at gmail.com. Go to the uh, website slave to the king.com, get signed up as a follower. And uh, if you, I haven't said this in a while, if you listen on to the podcast on any particular platform, say like Apple Podcasts or Google Play or something like that or or um, Spotify or iHeartRadio and there's a place for you where you can leave a review. Believe me, I don't get notifications about the reviews. Um, I think the only place that I have even can see them is on the Apple Podcast typically because... Um, you know, if I go there, it's like listed at the bottom. And so if I if I go out of my way to look for it, I, sometimes I find out. Um, but generally speaking, we don't see them. So I'm not asking for our purposes. But if you do leave a review, it helps others who are looking for podcasts some information that might help them know whether this is a podcast that would be useful to them. So that's something to consider. If you are a Podbean follower and you have comments about the show on the app, there is a place that you can actually leave comments about individual episodes. 
Uh, so some people like to do that. So I just want you to be aware of that. If if you even if you listen on a podcast app of your choice, but you wanted to leave some kind of comment, uh, that's one way you can do it. Is you can go, you can get download the Podbean app, and that's where it would allow you to actually comment on individual episodes. So some that's something else you can do. Uh, beyond that, if this has been helpful to you, I ask that you consider sharing it with others. Uh, hopefully, we can be a blessing to the body of Christ. So, uh, as my brother would say each and every week, find yourself someone to share the gospel with, with at least once a day. And then whatever you do this week, do it for the glory of God. Good night, God bless, and we'll see you guys next time.